So welcome to the first debate of the RSS 2020 workshop on SIM to Real for Robotics. Uh, the team, theme of this debate is why SIM to Real? And the proposition our invited speakers are going to debate in the next hour is investing into SIM to Real is a waste of time and money. I'm Sebastian and this is Ankur. Uh, and we have the great honor to be uh, moderating this debate today. So please note that there's a pre-poll on the RSS virtual conference website, where you can submit your opinion on this proposition before the debate. And there will be, there will be another poll after the debate so that we can see how opinions may have changed due to the arguments brought forward by our speakers. <clears throat> so before we start introducing our amazing speakers that we have here today, let us briefly motivate uh, why we are having this debate. So physical simulation uh, has been well established as an important tool for robotics, be it for robotics education or debugging and testing robot software. In recent years, however, we have been seeing more and more researchers getting more ambitious about what they believe simulation can do for robotics. They propose to use simulators for generating the data required to train machine learning models that enable our robots to see and manipulate the world. That means train and simulation, but deploy on the real robot. This idea, which is generally termed sim to real promises to significantly reduce uh, the, and or even remove the need for collecting large quantities of real world data and has the potential to change the way we build and teach our robot completely. In this debate, uh, we're looking forward to learn from our speakers here, from our experts, whether we should prepare ourselves for the sim to real revolution or whether we should ask our engineers and grad students to uninstall their simulation environments from their computers and spend more time with their robots again. <clears throat> okay, Ankur. Um, Ankur will introduce the structure of the debate. Hi everyone, I'm Ankur and I will be moderating and co-hosting this workshop together with Sebastian. So the debate of the the, the debate is structured as follows. We'll start by introducing our four panelists, two arguing for and two arguing against the proposition. Uh, know that we asked our speakers to take a particular opinion in this debate, which may or may not reflect their personal opinion or their employers. And each speaker will then have five minutes to deliver their opening statement. Uh, we will then transition to the actual discussion and wrap up the debate approximately five, 10 minutes before the end. Uh, Sebastian and I will moderate this and try to stay out of the debate as possible, but can interrupt here and there to make sure that we uh, cover as many interesting questions as we can. So I'll hand it over back to Sebastian to do the introduction of the first two speakers. So thank you. Uh, okay, so we're starting with the uh, pro uh, speakers, <coughs> arguing pro the proposition. So on the left corners, we have Abhinav Gupta. He's an associate professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, as well as a research manager at Facebook AI Research. Abinov's research focuses on scaling up machine learning by building self-supervised lifelong and interactive learning systems. Uh, se a seminal example of this work being his uh, really cool work on learning to grasp from 50K tries and 700 robot hours. Apart from his machine learning focus, Abinov has an amazing track record in computer vision and we're very grateful that Abhinav agreed to join this debate and I'm looking forward to his perspective on how robots and robotics vision can, can or should I say, cannot profit from sim to real So welcome, Abhinav. Um, the second proponent is Chris Ek Atkinson. Uh, Chris is professor at the Robotics Institute and Human Computer Interaction Institute at, as well as Carne at Carnegie Mellon University. And when trying to summarize his contributions to our research field, it's very difficult to identify a subfield of robotics where he actually hasn't made significant contributions. Uh, so his uh, contributions include, but are not limited to data efficient methods for robot control, bridging the gap between reinforcement learning and optimal control, but also novel actuators and sensors such as soft robots and robot skin. Uh, with your longstanding experience, uh, it's a great honor to have you on this debate. So thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, so turning on to the other side, we have two outstanding researchers who will be arguing against the proposition. That is, they will try to convince us that Simtereal is most definitely, definitely not a waste of time and money. 
So the first opponent is going to be Peter Valinder. Peter is a research scientist and roboticist at OpenAI. Before that, he co-founded Anchovy Labs, a startup using computer vision to organize photos that was acquired by Dropbox in 2012. He then joined Dropbox as an engineer and led the machine learning team there. I think there are very few people on earth who would fit better into this debate than Peter, who was the main contributor to OpenAI's latest uh, learning dexterity in Rubik's Cube projects. In these projects, Peter and his collaborators managed to enable robot to solve highly complex manipulation problems like solving Rubik's Cube with one hand by training robots only entirely in simulations. Thanks a lot for joining us, Peter. Thank you. Uh, and the last and not the least, it's my great pleasure to also introduce Ken Goldberg, professor at UC Berkeley and chief scientist at Ambidextrous Robotics. Ken has done a lot of outstanding work in robotics and automation research, ranging from medical robots over cloud robotics to grasping. I'm sure that many in the audience are well aware of his highly impactful work on DexNet, a family of deep networks for grasping that achieves state-of-the-art grasping performance despite and maybe because being trained on synthetic data only. Also, it's important to say that Ken is not only a roboticist, but also an inventor and artist who's created award-winning artwork and films. Thanks a lot for joining us, Ken. Thank you, Ankar. Okay, so uh, next we will continue with the opening statements by our speakers, and we will alternate between the pro and the con side. So we were starting with Abhinath, then Peter, and then back to the pro side, Chris, and finally, Ken will conclude our opening remarks. So please, Abhinath, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me for this amazing debate. Um, I think it's very interesting that I have been trying to take this stand that simulation is not useful uh, in computer vision community for pretty long. And I, interestingly, Peter was in one of the debates with me uh, in Munich. And so I think Peter knows a lot of my points. But anyways, um, before I start, I think I, I will try to set up the premises of what I think the basic question is. And I am asking a question, and I'm taking a very machine learning standpoint because that's where I come from. Um, so is physical simulation even necessary for learning? And what I'm going to argue is that simulation is not necessary for learning. And since simulation is not necessary for learning, sim to real has no meaning. So it's like a dual step, essentially. I'm not going to argue on sim to real. I'm going to argue on the simulation itself, essentially. I think there are two disclaimers I want to put before I start. Um, so first, I think it is, I want to, uh, I'm not arguing against learning to simulate. Like if you're learning models and you want to do model-based RL and so on, I'm not arguing any against any of that. I'm arguing against humans modeling the world with analytical simulators and physical simulators essentially uh, for learning. Second, I think for some environments, simulation make complete sense. So some of these are non-rich environments where like navigation only 3D properties change and so on, or some environments where there's high value, uh, basically like it's very dangerous and so on. So for example, uh, flying flight simulations and so on. And these are high value environments and I'm not arguing against that, I'm, uh, against those, I'm arguing, all the arguments I'm making is in context of manipulation and like the basic manipulation of a five-year-old, essentially manipulation capabilities of five-year-old. Okay. So now that I've put my, like what question I'm trying to answer and what's the disclaimer, what we are trying to argue is whether I should use real world data for training or whether I should use simulator for training. So first, I mean, I think it's very surprising that why would anyone not do any learning in real world? Like we know babies learn in real world. Everyone, like all the machines that we know that work, work in real world. So why would you not learn? Why would you not try to learn in real world? Or, or why would you even think about using a simulator? So the first argument is real world robotics is pretty unscalable, right? It, the speed is very slow. Um, you will not be able to collect millions of examples or hundred years of examples like Peters, for example, work, uh, which uses uh, essentially. Second argument you can say is real world will have give us very hard time to find diverse data. So there's a amount of data, then the diversity of data. And you can argue that, oh, a lot of the data I will collect up being will be in Berkeley lab or in OpenAI lab or something like that. So how would I ever find diverse examples essentially and so on. The third example, which people argue for simulators a lot, and I think this is their, at least I saw Ken's argument is that at least there's this argument that at least it has to work in simulation. If it doesn't work in simulation, it will never work in real world. Like, so it will basically simulation can be a way to do fast development and testing essentially here. Uh, are the, that's a third reason why anyone would want to use simulator. And finally, danger argument is the fourth argument. Like 
whatever it is, we don't want to break our robots. Robots are expensive or whatever it's hard. And so why we don't want to use that uh, essentially. So these are the reasons why anyone would want to use simulator. Um, and why anyone would not want to use simulator. I mean, just to be on the, and why I'm, what am I arguing is basically like first physical domain gap is huge. We know contact dynamics is still far from any model is being modeled in any of the simulators currently. We we still see uh, like properties of friction, properties of how two things behave and then contact is very bad. Second, I'm going to argue that most of the simulators are going to be too simple, right? I mean, we are, they are not modeling the richness of the real world. And if there's one lesson we have learned, we have learned that uh, time again and again, it has been proven that simplicity, like, which is like, for example, blocks world simplicity led to bad algorithms or algorithms which will fail to generalize when you think, oh, I can do mathematical modeling of everything I can now, or I can do learning with of everything from this uh, simple, simple, simplistic environment and then basically make it work. And these have, algorithms have failed to generalize time and again. So history has been a guide here for us uh, specifically. Um, and then, okay, sorry, uh, there is this background noise. Uh, I, I was outside. Um, and then finally, simulators will require too much effort and too many priors uh, to model. Okay, so these are the reasons why anyone, I'll try to move uh, inside for one second, uh, or at least far away from this uh, noise. You're fine, uh, Abhinav. All right, if, you're, if you think I'm fine, I'm just gonna sit out here. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to argue, so now that I've seen why we should not use simulator, I'm going to go back and argue one by one against why everyone is saying we should use simulator. So first people argue uh, real world robotics is unscalable. I think what we have seen in the last three or four years is actually un completely opposite, right? So Google Arm Farm, Berkeley working example and our grasping example, we have shown again and again that you could collect hundreds and thousands of examples from robots pretty easily. It's not hard. And, but what is exciting is the future. The cost of robots are decreasing dramatically from $400,000 PR to robots to 10,000 and 5,000 robots are coming uh, essentially. And if you think of 5,000 robots, right? That's almost a cost of a GPU. How many GPUs does these uh, big companies would have? Tens of thousands of GPUs. Now think of having tens of thousands of robots collect, trying to collect data in parallel. And now I don't see any issues with uh, real world learning in ro with ro uh, physical robots themselves. So if you could scale up physical uh, data collection and data acquisition in physical world. I just do not see why we should actually do simulation ever, uh, essentially. The second argument was the diversity, that in real world, it's uh, very hard to collect diverse data. Real world experiments are mostly done in lab, so they will never generalize maybe even in real world and so on. But I think this is like a double-edged argument, right? Because if you think of simulators, most of the simulators I know of have the diversity problem with themselves, right? I mean, they are modeling one world, one environment and richly and so on. On the other hand, with um, with the real world, so one of the things that we have been doing, for example, was using Airbnbs, like you can rent out Airbnbs. And so it takes almost like $75 in Pittsburgh to get a new environment instantly. So I feel that the, the diversity argument is actually very much on the side of uh, real world robotics. Every $75 will give you a new environment. In simulation, you will need designers, graphic designers, and all these engineers to model one environment. And one environment takes years if you have to model the richness of that one environment, essentially. The third argument was fast development and or this argument that at least it has to work in simulation if it has to work in real world. I think, again, that is a very wrong argument because in simulation, we are making things simple. For example, I might not be trying to simulate haptics or I might not be trying to simulate audio. The richness of the real world is where some of the solutions might lie. Might lie. So some of the algorithms which will work, not work with, um, you would say like weak data or scarce data, like only vision, for example, like uh, will might, so in simulation, you might have only vision. So that might not work with vision, but when you use the multimodality, the richness of the world, the haptics and so on, it might start to work. So. This argument that it seems like a not a convincing argument to me that it has to work in simulation, then it will work in real world. Maybe in real world, we can use a lot of these richness properties to make our algorithms work and so on. And the last argument was uh, basically this idea of the tail data and danger argument. Interestingly, our babies, and so I have a 
16 month old baby or, or sorry 17 month old uh, from tomorrow so 17 month old baby he is pretty dangerous he tries to go down the stairs and he will jump and so on and he gets hurt a lot uh, essentially so this whole argument if babies which are living organ, organ, organisms can take this danger of learning manipulation by actually trying things I think that with robots, I think we do not have this argument. So what we actually need here is advancement in hardware. And so basically we need soft and squishy robots, which are less prone to get broken down. And so we need more soft robots and so on. And we need mother of robots. Like we as parents make sure that the baby doesn't get hurt too badly that it cannot recover. He or she cannot recover essentially. So we need probably a much more guidance in uh, some of the danger, like, the dangerous uh, experiments that babies do. And so we need mother in some sense, like the mother's parents play a very important role and that's what we need for our robots essentially as well. So, I mean, to summarize um, the four reasons why anyone would use simulator, it doesn't seem like those four arguments hold at least to me. And then there are these three arguments why one should not use simulator. They seem to hold completely for me. Uh, and so I think that's why we should not use simulators at all for learning. I'm not sure if I'm on time or I delayed it at all. Or we ran, we ran slightly over time, but it's fine. Thank you, Ebenef. Thank you. Okay. So our next uh, speaker will be from the uh, opponent side, and it will be Peter. So please start. Cool, yeah. Thank you very much, Ebenef, for those, those arguments. And, and so I, I, in my opening statement, I will take a slightly different uh, take. So I will kind of go through th three things I think is um, kind of important here. Um, one, uh, I think it's important to kind of say that, to make clear that sim to real does not mean sim only. Uh, you know, I think that sim to real often gets this bad rep that, you know, just because people make the assumption that uh, sim to real is just all those fancy demos you see in a simulated environment um, uh, of, of robots doing really amazing things and they don't end up working on the real robots. And that's not really what, what we mean by sim to real. The real part here is what matters. And as Abhinav pointed out, like there is like the, this, uh, there is this kind of domain gap uh, the same to real gap is a, is a real thing. Now, I actually think that we can overcome this gap, but, and I think it's, that's kind of what is really re interesting to do research on. Um, I, I do I do feel like like uh, I feel like some responsibility for the bad perception of of uh, of simulators uh, and like cool demos and simulators because of, like a lot of those are running on OpenAI and gym environments, and so people you know publish papers in those environments, media outlets pick them up and hype them and make it sound like robotics has been solved because you know you can get a robot. Uh, to do round kicks and running parkour through an obstacle course and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, I think maybe we should be a bit more careful about saying like, here's, here's a result on a, on a simulated robot. And, and, you know, maybe even in OpenAI Gym, we should add something like, you know, this is a simulated robot. It hasn't been tried in real. Don't try this at home. Um, just to make it very clear that a, a result on a simulated environment is not a result on a real robot. Um, we try to be very careful about this kind of, we don't, we, we, we kind of want to only we only want to publish that are actually work on the real robot and I think you know for example for when we did the Rubik's cube ma manipulation you know it took us like a month or two to do to get this working in the simulator but then it took us like two years to get to work on the real robot so this this real part is really really difficult and it's uh, important to, to recognize that because I think that's kind of really that's where a lot of the interesting research really lies like why does that take two years to move from sim to real how can we make that like you know two minutes or something um, and so that's kind of my, the second part I want to talk about here is like, why is sim to real so interesting? Um, there's just so many unsolved problems and opportunities here for us to tackle. Uh, the fact that, you know, we have kind of shown now that, uh, you know, the work that, uh, Ken has done on, on grasping, for example, or we have done on simulation, like it's crazy that you can train something in simulation and it works on a real robot, but you know, it, it does require a fair amount of work. Like you need to do a, a, fair, a big amount of like manual SysID. Uh, you need to uh, kind of use, today you use a lot of these kind of pretty dumb methods like uh, domain randomization. Uh, that takes a lot of compute. It just wastes a lot of compute. And uh, that's not great, but that's a great problem to solve. And if we can figure out things like tightening the loop between simulation and reality and so on, then, then, then we can actually, um, then, then I think we will, we have we can get some really uh, and start getting like even more amazing results here, and 
you know, I, I, I'm not sure if like symmetry real entirely can get us like to 99.999% accuracy, but even if symmetry real can get us to kind of 90 or 99 where we do the last bit, uh, bit on real, you know, if that saves us like the amount of training you have to do in the real world by say 10x, that's super valuable. And you know, those are the kind of problems that we need to solve. And I think the last thing I'm gonna point out is that sim to real has this amazing property where it lowers the barrier to research. And you know, I, I think it's kind of crazy to say that um, that 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 real like sim to sim to real is kind of costly. If you think about like just the cost of buying and maintaining and experimenting with real robot software uh, hardware, you know, we, it's true that sometimes we kind of spend on the order of like a few thousand dollars to train an algorithm. Again, we're using pretty dumb methods today. Um, but you know, we spend a hundred times that uh, on a very small number of robots. And yeah, sure, maybe even we can get to kind of more cheaper robots over time. But you know, they're cheaper in hardware, but they often cost more in just maintenance. They break more often. They're just harder to control and so on. So I, I kind of I'm a little bit more pessimistic than Abhinav on us getting being able to use uh, use use the, these kind of robots get really diverse set of data. Um, I, I've been really excited by the fact that we have getting really good uh, kind of robot um, kind of RL results and stuff like that in simulators. And I think that's really, you know, really helpful for the research. Not all of that will transfer to the real robots, but it is kind of interesting. And it kind of, uh, it, it, some of it will, and some of it will end up being really, really useful. I think we do need to think about how we can kind of make the environments a little bit more realistic, like slightly better ways to control, uh, like more realistic ways to control robots and so on. You know, I can't tell the number of times I've seen like a robot kind of piercing an object in a simulator, like, you know, like T-1000 in Terminator 2 or something, uh, rather than actually picking it up just because it can do that in a simulator. And obviously that doesn't transfer to the real world, but those things are pretty easy to fix. We can fix those. We don't need super accurate simulators, but we just fix the, the kind of the, the simplest low hanging fruit kind of. So I kind of would like to kind of just finish up by saying like, I think we have enough evidence now that seem to real actually works. You can get hard problems like grasping with, with, with Dexnet or like, uh, you know, uh, manipulation working in simulator and then transfer to real robots. So I kind of feel like seem to really is kind of here to stay and it's making a real difference in robotics research. So instead of kind of criticizing it, we should really embrace it as a tool in our toolbox that we should really learn how to use optimally. And it, it won't replace the work of making kind of stuff working on real robots. It's really gonna kind of just make that, that work more interesting. That's, that's me. Thanks a lot, Peter. Okay, let's move again to the pro side and continue with Chris. Okay, that was great. Uh, you heard from Abhinav, who is the young revolutionary. He's all about new paradigms. I'm the old uh, cranky establishment figure in this debate. Uh, at some level, uh, I'm a gatekeeper. I have to worry about the field. I have to worry about questions like how do we allocate scarce resources you know, across the entire field? And of course that gets boiled down to what gets funded. So uh, I'm gonna talk from that perspective. Uh, let me knock off just a couple things. One is I have no opinion on sim to real for work in perception or computer vision. The second is I support anything that works. Anything that results in robust policies that work on actual robots, I'm all for it. As long as you can demonstrate that, you'll get my money. Okay, research is about placing bets. Uh, my personal bet uh, is I bet on reality, uh, not sim to real. Uh, both industry and research uh, have to have immune systems to fight bad work and bad ideas. And to be honest with you, you know, sim to real might be a great thing, but it enables a lot of crappy work. Uh, so on the whole, it might not be good for the field. Uh, this is actually a really old issue. Uh, it used to be the case, for example, that the patent office required you to have a working model in order to get a patent because they knew you can't take a lot of verbiage. Uh, of course, that was pre-computers, but you can't take computer output seriously. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what we teach robotic students, either explicitly or by osmosis, uh, to help them avoid uh, wasting their time doing crappy work. And you know, one of the values that 
was imparted to me 40 years ago, and I impart to those who follow, is extreme skepticism of simulation. Uh, and in industry and in robotics, uh, one of the messages is, look, if you're gonna do simulation and you're gonna take it seriously, you have to demonstrate that you've eliminated the sim to real gap in any significant way. Uh, so, you know, the by far majority point of view is either you have no sim to real gap or you're testing on reality. Uh, and that's that's standard industry practice. Uh, practice. Uh, and, you know, one of the things we've learned in robotics is usually it's not worth spending the effort making a simulation accurate when you could just do it in reality. It, it, it's a lot cheaper. Um, when I, as I mentioned, I was a graduate student 40 years ago, and, you know, the message was, sure, simulations are great for debugging your ideas, debugging your code, but not much else. And uh, I was trained when I review papers to basically reject papers that only had simulation results. And one of the memes of the time and now is simulations are doomed to succeed. Uh, I also want to point out that um, engineering has been working on the sim to real gap for a long time. They have a whole field called adaptive control that's about dealing with a sim to real gap. And it's kind of startling that, you know, the folks in machine learning who work on sim to real basically ignore all this prior work. There's an entire second field of control theory called robust control. And their answer is, don't try to figure out what, or overfit to the model you have, figure out a way in advance that you could handle any possible model. And, you know, they're willing to take the hit on performance in order to do that. Uh, I get nervous when I fly because I think about, you know, how good was the simulator they used to verify their controller? And, you know, Boeing has been digging themselves out of a hole with their 737 MAX thing, uh, you know, partly because they were sloppy. They had sloppy sim to real. Um, I would like to point out there have been excellent examples of good modeling. One is uh, work by Huangbo and Lee and a, a bunch of other people that came out in science robotics last year called Learning Agile and Dynamic Motor Skills for Legged Robots. And, uh, you know, that's a shining example that learning can learn a model that's so good, there's essentially no sim to real gap and it just works in the first place. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time. So I want to jump straight to a couple jokes, uh, and you know I'll 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 try to uh, <laughs> get back to all my nasty things to say later. Uh, first, let me say something nice. Uh, it is likely that sim to real is really useful for meta learning or learning to learn what you might call higher level learning. Uh, in our experience, that works very well. Okay, here come the jokes. First of all, the carbon footprint of sim to real is horrible. If you want to save the world, save the environment, do your work in reality. The carbon footprint's much less. Second, do you really want to take my funding away? I mean, look at me. You know, I depend on people who believe that working with reality is important. I, you know, I'm an experimental roboticist. You know, we got to support that. More, more than we got to support, and I'll be totally honest with you, joke number three, we have had an invasion of computer vision and machine learning people in robotics. They're not serious about robotics. They're just going to play with their simulations and then drop it on the floor. Nobody's going to push that and do the 99% of the work to make it useful for robotics. And, you know, I see these sort of research by press release of yet another totally weird running from deep mind. And I think to myself, wow, this is a total waste of money and time. If we had just taken the computational, you know, resources they spent on that project and gave them to me, I could do much better. All right. I think I'm out of time. Um, next, we'll have Ken to explain his viewpoints in favor of simulations.
Again, you're muted. All right, very good. Thank you, Chris. Listen, I, I think there's one thing we can definitely agree on. You are old and cranky. Now let's get to the uh, topic here. I recently for Father's Day walked across the Golden Gate Bridge with my daughters and they asked me, how did this bridge get built? So I looked it up and I was really pleased to learn about the processes they use, lots and lots of simulations and models. Most of them run with slide rules. And I was very fortunate because if they had tried to just build that bridge without any of these, then uh, I would, we would not be walking across that bridge today. Now, I hope it's all, we can also agree that it's important for us to define our terms. So sim to real is where some aspects of a problem are simulated to prepare for experiments with real physical systems. So the topic statement, investing into sim to real is a waste of time and money, is utterly false and without merit. Sim to real is exactly the opposite. It's an important savings of time and money, and it's a vital component of robotics research. Now let's first dispel with our opponent's straw man argument that simulation isn't reality. Of course, we agree with that. There's a reality gap, and there's a huge gap, and, it's going to, and anyone who claims otherwise has been watching too many remakes of The Matrix. Now, as Peter also pointed out, the other straw man argument is that one can't stop with simulation alone. I fully agree with that. That's what I call sim to null. Sim, S-I-M, to the number N-U-L-L, -L, where simulation is, is just the end point. And I'm totally against that as well. But let's talk about our topic today, which is sim to real, where simulation is used to prepare for real experiments. Now, I hope we can also agree that there's a huge swath of simulation that works reasonably well. For example, logic circuits or CAD models or slide rules for bridges. Now it's not perfect, but up to some level of detail, it usually the results are usually correct. Now there's some simulations, for example, in uh, viral infection that offer some insights, but they're not very reliable. And then there's simulations in economics, which everyone knows are often wrong, always wrong. But let's focus on robotics. So simulations can be confusing. People often confuse fact from fiction if they watch a lot of Westworld or, well, the White House. Uh, it's easy to fool the eye. Ask any magician. My favorite example is pareidolia. It's our tendency to see faces in random patterns. But simulation is a critical step for researchers, but it can never be the only step. So it's, I want to say that simulation is a valuable, necessary condition. If your algorithm fails in simulation, it's not gonna work in reality. But simulation is never a sufficient condition. If your algorithm works in simulation, you still have no idea if it's gonna work in reality. So what exactly is this argument against sim to real? Is the alternative to dispensing with sim altogether as my opponents are arguing and doing experiments only with real hardware, just building things right away and seeing how that turns out? Well, <clears throat> that seems extremely time consuming and costly and not to mention dangerous. Now, it is, we found this out the hardware, I think all of us, that if we build things that oftentimes we have to rebuild them and redesign them, and that is extremely time consuming, and that adds to the carbon footprint as well, Chris, because you have to order all this equipment and it has to come and be shipped and back and forth. Now, in sim to real the idea is to first simulate and study and tune your system, and only if the results are promising, then you start to do the work in real hardware. You start to build and design the hardware. So um, the idea of simulation is that it's narrowed down the range of hardware and it's improved your algorithm so that you have a better chance of things working out in reality. Now it still may not work, but it's, it's just, it's loading your, it's hedging your bets to use your, your point earlier. So the, let's also talk about deep learning and data collection, as I've not mentioned in sim, to, sim versus real. Now, there's huge advances in, as we all know, Moore's Law, GPUs, cloud computing that have brought down the cost of, of simulation. And data collection in SIM has the advantage of being far less expensive, safer, and faster. And it also provides a number of other advantages because you have access to ground truth, you can do resets, and it also provides a nice level playing field between algorithms. So I can compare the same algorithm on the same data sets and see how they compare. So this is, this is extremely valuable. Now, and I also wanna say that it's improving. Sim is improving, but there'll always be a gap with reality. 
Some current limitations include inaccurate models of deformation, friction, multi-point co point contact, cutting, impact, and indeterminism in general. So you don't have to go far to find an example. Just try pushing a pencil repeatedly across the desk in front of you with another pencil. If you try and do it exactly the same way in each case, the pencil will often end up in very different, in, in very different um, positions, poses. And this is because of the inherent indeterminacy. There's the, the, the surface friction is un, unknowable. So this is an essentially undecidable. How the pencil is going to wind up is undecidable. So I want to fully agree that, that simulation is, is tricky. In fact, I want to fundamentally disagree with the old adage that simulation is doomed to succeed. Actually, no. Simulations fail all the time. And that's why they're necessary, a valuable necessary condition, because they can rapidly reveal and help us prune out the weak algorithms. So if your simulation isn't better than previous baseline algorithms, I'm sorry, if your algorithm isn't better than, than previous baseline algorithms in simulation, it's not going to be better in real experiments. It's better to discover this as early as possible. So the objective of sim to real is to reduce the time consuming and costly and dangerous mistakes in the early stage of real experiments. SIM can greatly speed up hyperparameter hyper tuning, and in that sense, SIM to real saves time and money. So the topic statement, investing into SIM to real is a waste of time and money, is completely false and without merit. It's exactly the opposite. It's an important savings of time and money and an essential component of robotics research. Thank you. So thanks a lot to all of you for these fantastic opening statements. I think we've seen a lot of agreement, but also likely a lot of disagreement already. And um, so the first question I would like to ask to our panelists is um, something that came up in the um, discussion right now is how to do sim to real And especially what um, Ken has been saying um, about how to use simulation and also what Peter has been saying that it took so long to actually get the simulator, uh, the real uh, Rubik's Cube uh, solution running. It sounds much more like sim to grad student to real than sim to real. Are we actually really doing, is that what you're proposing, really doing sim to real? Let me, if, if I can take a shot at that. Uh, my advice to graduate students is to implement something in the, on a real robot first. And then if they're going to go back to simulation, they are now informed about what matters and what doesn't. Uh, you know, I tell graduate students, you can waste a lot of time working in simulation and realize later none of that work mattered to get the real thing to work in reality. Uh, I will second the reality is much harder than simulation. I calculate, we, I spent about 15 years working on human legged locomotion. We had working simulations in the first year and we then spent the rest of the time <laughs> trying to get the robot to work. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's where the action is. I, I would say, like, one thing I would say here is that, uh, you know, it's um, there, it, like, getting, going from sim to real does take a lot of, you know, you know, say grad student time in some sense. Uh, but that's, like, kind of the point. There is a lot of research to be done here. Like, like this is why it's interesting. Like, we want to get to a point where it's, it, it, you don't need that. And we haven't come up with all those methods yet, but we know that some very simple methods kind of do work if you push them really, really far. And, um, you know, so kind of getting, getting to that point where it's not like uh, a year of somebody's time to make that transfer work, yeah, but like a few, a few weeks or eventually like a few days or even a few minutes. I think that's like the big challenge that we will try to figure out. Um, and I think the fact that we now have existence proof of this working from some really hard tasks should give us a lot of confidence that we can actually achieve that. Um, the fact that you can do manipulation, the fact that you can do grasping and so on, those are hard problems that I think, you know, sure, there, there's been like, there are old ways of like, uh, old school methods of doing that around adaptive control and so on, but they're, you know, they run into all these issues with like contacts and like they don't scale necessarily to, to kind of the, the, the real problems that we, we're trying to get robots to do. And trying to really, um, but, but we know that it works if you go from sim to real. So like trying to kind of really figure out how to do that in a much more principled way is like, that's a really cool challenge. And I think that's what we should be spending time on because that, that could potentially uh, just uh, make us solve 
problems much faster rather than waiting for like hardware to get cheaper and, and more reliable and so on. Like we, we, we are at the stage where we can solve these problems today. So I think um, I'm going to be, um, I'm not going to just keep arguing. I think what we need is a more debate where we can reach some interesting uh, agreement here. So I think this whole idea that if you, what does sim to real working even mean? I don't think even we agree on that part. I mean, for, so for example, when you say sim to real works, I'm thinking what does sim to real works? If you train on the, if the simulation is the same object as the real object and you already try to make with the real object as close as possible in the simulation, like you spent enough time in making simulation, but that was only one object. Remember one object, if it took you so much time to do one object, now look, think of my world. My baby has hundred thousand objects in front of him. He, he's interacting with daily. So at least let's agree that the definition of working would be your simulation was a different object and your testing was a different object. Now, at least give me that generalization. I mean, I am, so I agree that, I mean, Chris is right that a lot of machine learning and computer vision people will come and they will do crappy work on simulation. They will never do real world and they will run away. And that's what we are seeing actually already. I mean, like the, so I agree that the barrier is falling, but the barrier has fallen so much that now, like I think Dieter Fox gave me the best example in one of the thesis defense he asked, Every year I see these simulation papers. One graph is always at the bottom. Other graph is always at the top. What the hell is happening? How, how is it, does it happen that the next cycle, the same graph which was up will fall down and then there's a newer graph which will come go exactly at the right uh, location as in. And so he was really astonished with this, all this thing. And I think that is in some sense so to me is what kind of playing up with parameters in simulators. You play up, play up with a lot of parameters. You make the other fail and you make yourself work and you just go there and say, ah, see my approach works. I think so. this whole idea, I mean, I agree that some people are going to keep doing sim to real. Some people are going, going to do real. There's, I don't think we are here to convince anyone to change sides completely, but let's, if we can even come to agreement on what will make me convinced when you are saying sim to real works is I think for me, that has been the, main argument here. Like if you can show me generalization, if you can show me this is going to scale up to hundreds and thousands of objects, not just one object. I'll repeat again, doing one object is not like you can spend engineer time in simulation to do that one object and then go and make it in the real world. I am not surprised with that, but okay. Me, okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Gotcha. So, so I mean, I'm, I am here. We are here to make a, try and make an argument here. And I think that the statement is not sent to real works. That's not what we're arguing. And I would totally oppose that anyway, because I, it doesn't. In most cases, it doesn't work. And you have to, it, 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 out of the box, it's not going to work. And I think that your point though, is that to dispense with simulation altogether, that's, that's the argument that you seem to be making. And I can't, I, I can't accept that because simulation is a valuable step in the process. As I, as I said, it's, 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 a, it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. So when your analogy with the baby is interesting, I think um, your young son, by the way, uh, hopefully you as well as the mother work on the uh, supervision part, but it's very important that the, um, the baby, you have to acknowledge that the babies, humans have an enormous, they bring an enormous amount to the process. Their learning is not ab initio. They have essentially lots of, 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 of wiring that's built in. And moreover, I think that babies actually do simulate in the form of dreaming. And I think we all do that, but in our brain, there's some process of simulation that's going on. So it's, it's very important. And I think that, you know, we should be guard against this xenophobia about uh, computer vision researchers. I actually find computer vision to be a very interesting field and I welcome these researchers. <laughs> I think that uh, one of the things that's interesting for, I'll, I'll, I'll say for DexNet is an example where we were looking at, at the advances of ImageNet and how it was able to actually reach a critical mass of, of examples during a label of examples for supervised vision that actually allowed it to generalize remarkably well. And so we asked the question, could that work in, in for grasping? And so the first step was to, to get a very large data set of examples. And so I've been up that was to the point. It's not just for one object. We trained it on millions of examples of grasps. And then, and I was fully skeptical about this. And I believe also, by the way, we all can agree skepticism is very important. Chris, you were trained well, and I also come from that same school, school of thinking, which is you've got to be skeptical, and I am. But I, so I didn't, I didn't have any illusions that this was work, and I was surprised, just, just really shocked that it worked as well as it did. And this is what, and, and again, we tested it on new objects that had never seen before in physical reality. That was the, te the litmus test and it was working. It started working remarkably well. It had learned some kind of affordances about grasping of, of, of very oddly shaped objects. 
And then we were able to extend the amount of, of examples vastly more than was able to, to, to happen in, in the physical experiments. As you know, the ARM farm was very successful. It's very expensive, a year's worth of experimentation, but we can run about the same number of experiments overnight with DexNet. So I think there's something to be said that, that there is a very important role for sim to real It's not solved by any means, but it's one thing that we should be putting our money to. And Chris, to your point about, about money, and resources. I agree, they're scarce, but it's not a zero-sum some game. If we can start showing successes in practice, then we're going to see more industry money flowing into the field. So I think we need, should use whatever works, to your point. And sim to real is a very effective tool. So back to the, we're uh, essentially thinking like a funding agency. Let me echo what Avanov said and maybe make it a little more explicit. I think real to real in other words, transfer learning across robots is a much higher priority research area than sim to real. I also think self to self, in other words, transfer across time with the same robot. So unlike most of our demos, you know, the robot does something, it works every day first time instead of, oh, I have to futz with it to make it work. Those two things, real to real and self to self, are higher priority than sim to real. And let me just mention, I happen to have good friends who happen to be computer vision researchers. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, that was a poor taste joke. <laughs> can I? Uh, I just want to add a couple of things. I mean, um, so uh, Ken, I think I for the first disclaimer I put was. If you have learned to simulate, it's okay because model-based RL, I'm not arguing against. I mean, I'm arguing against physical and analytical uh, simulators here, right? rather than like trying to model uh, by humans. If you learn yourself from data and you are using that to mod do model-based RL, so that, which is what your baby dreaming argument was. I think that's okay with me. And I think that should be a major part of our learning, uh, essentially. The second argument, I think, um, which you put of DexNet, I mean, I, I think I love the DexNet work, but I think it is critical to uh, say something like, in DexNet, you have to assume perfect 3D. Uh, uh, so like your 3D cameras have to be really good for grasping to work. And when we tried with the crappy 3D camera, by crappy, I mean $300, $350 or something, it again has issues. And I think that is, and it's not about DexNet, it's about real issue between sim to real, right? I mean, so you have to make some assumptions in simulation, like when you're putting in simulator. Are those assumptions going to hold in the real world? Now you can try to make them hold in the real world by doing more, uh, instrumentation, or you can be in structured environment, which is perfectly fine. And I'm not, not arguing, I mean, so for st structured environment, these things I agree might have chance and so on. But we are, what I'm talking about is unstructured environment. I'm talking about the intelligence of a four-year-old, five-year-old, and the, that comes from the richness of the world, ever, a world, like interaction with the world. And that's where I think there, there's a lot of argument to be made. I mean, and finally, I want to say I'm not I think I have given up on that I fact that I can convince people not to use simulator. Uh, I think I think this is never going to happen. I have been trying it for two or two or three years in computer vision and everyone in computer vision actually want to use simulator, not uh, real world robots. I think what I'm just trying to be is on a common ground for what we will think is a definition of your like sim to real work or real to real work essentially. Uh, like what is the definition of working here uh, is I think that if we can come to that common ground, I think I am and I like Chris said, if things work, you know what, I'll be the first to jump. Uh, and so I am ready to jump. I'm just trying to figure out what is the definition of working. I kind of feel like one, I think it's interesting uh, how, how you guys brought up kind of the, the real to real and, and, and you know, uh, self, self to self kind of uh, approaches because I, I actually feel like um, the way I would tackle a lot of those, and I agree, those are really interesting problems. But I, I actually feel like the way I would tackle a lot of those are through sim to real. Like it's, um, I feel like if you solve the sim to real problem, like you will solve a lot of those problems as well. Um, the, the, you know, the, the nice thing about having simulators and so on, is, as as uh, as as Ken pointed out, is like kind of there, there's a lot of things you can do very easily. You can reset the environment. You can you can change parameters very easily. You can really like change like you can. Uh, you know, you can uh, artificially break the robots in different ways. Like it really allows you to kind of try those those things out in a way where they're robust in the simulator, but then also robust on the real robot. And I feel like if we can solve those 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 issues in the sim to real gap, I kind of feel like real to real will be easy, and as uh, you know, self to self will also be easy. Um, 
but like sitting, like manually going like, and, and making small differences between robots, like buying lots of robots to kind of prove your point and, and, and uh, kind of artificially like you're going breaking your robots and so on. Like that's, you know, that's, that takes a lot of time. It's really hard to make progress on that. Like while we now have, we know that we, we have a more kind of tractable approach. I actually feel like that's where we should be in spending a lot of, of time and effort is just solving that problem because a lot of those other cool things will be solved as a side effect. <laughs> Again, from a funding point of view, I'd like to do a little myth busters here. There's a myth that simulation and sim to real are a cheaper way in, uh, to do research and democratize research. And in fact, it's the very opposite. Uh, huge amounts of computer time are used uh, by Google, for example, to train Alpha Zero. And what I was told about your open AI hand is that it costs about $5,000 every time you trained a policy. And, you know, that, those costs add up. And in the end, simulation is much more expensive than just doing it on the real robots. So uh, let me just answer that because I, I think that's an interesting argument. Uh, I actually feel like, you know, there's a difference between like going to zero from zero to one to one to n in some way. Like, like if you want to show that something actually works, it's going to cost you much more. Like how much did the first kind of even like hard, like hardware robots cost? They probably cost a decent amount of money. Like how much does a PR2 cost? That's a half a million dollars. And Atlas is probably on the order of like a million dollars or something. Like if you want to kind of do something that, like to show that you can kind of get something really hard working the first time, it's going to cost, cost you more. Uh, the whole point is like once you have kind of shown like hey actually this this works and then, then you, you kind of have a map of like where are the issues here like why does it cost like five thousand dollars or something I, I I don't know how much it costs probably you're right in that order of magnitude five thousand dollars to train uh, uh, an algorithm from scratch in a simulator well because like there's a bunch of uh, like you are randomizing a lot of stuff that doesn't matter and so on like that that's uh, it may like maybe the way we're going about domain randomization uh, is kind of a bit silly and, 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 and premature. So we sh like, but that's the point, like that's the stuff we need to solve. And well, eventually uh, there are also kind of, as Ken pointed out, there's a lot of places where you can just do it on a laptop as well. So how do we, how do we basically bring every problem down to uh, kind of a laptop level kind of, uh, uh, kind of training run where it's only a matter of like, you paid for your laptop once and then it's not, it doesn't cost you very much to run a, another training run. I, I think that's where we want to get to. Um, so like, again, like zero to one is, is expensive, I agree, but like we, sh we should be focused on the one to many problem here. And it's the same thing goes for like generalizing to more objects and so on. I totally agree. This is like, this is where we, sh we should be proving it out that it doesn't only work for one thing, but for multiple things. It's the same, same issue of going from zero to one, one to many. So, so another point I want, and so the barrier to entry, I also want to address that because Chris, you know, the, is for, there's many students around the world in India and China and, and where there, it's not practical for them to experiment with real robots necessarily. And it's not an end point again, but so tools like OpenAI Jim actually are a way for them to get engaged. They can start to do experiments. It's very clear uh, that it's important that we should make clear that that's not the end point, that, that if they have something that succeeds there, that's a good step, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna work in reality. But it's a, it's a door, it brings people in, it gets students in, inspired and, and engaged and they actually can start to do research. So I think it, it, to Peter's point, I think that, that simulation has value there. Again, I think the thing we're all agreeing on violently here is that sim is not the endpoint, and that is very clear. And the, currently there are challenges to get from sim to real is very hard, but that's a beautiful topic for research. I think it's a very valuable thing for us to be putting our, our efforts into as a field because domain randomization methods currently are very weak. And I'm gonna have, you know, to your point about, about precision, we actually simulate error in the sensor error in the control and error in the physics, because that is very important. We have to, the, the resulting grasps have to be robust. That is really, to my mind, the, the, why DexNet succeeded was because it used analytic methods, the old school ideas, Chris, that, that have been developed over the last 200 years to, to define robustness, characterize that, and then learn the robustness factor, the, the quality measure that that was then used to, to predict good grasps. If you look at what's happened in the field uh, of sort of, let's say, machine learning for robotics, there's this dominance of gradient descent. And if you look at the typical formulation of a, a reinforcement learning algorithm, 
where it explores stochastically and has a sto you know, therefore has a stochastic policy. Uh, it's unbelievably inefficient. And the hacks that people are using to make it more efficient, for example, in Q-learning, you have something called a target function, uh, which essentially means you've decided I'm gonna do batch learning. I'm gonna run the thing for a while and then switch my target function and run the thing for a while. And if you're gonna do that, you might as well use much better methodologies. You could you know, basically use second order uh, optimization routines to train your Q function, uh, which dramatic, I'm talking about orders of magnitude speed up. So what we're seeing is, you know, because in some sense, there's all this compute around, people are lazy. They're not thinking hard about how to make this stuff efficient. They'll just, you know, run it on a few more computers. And this is intellectually very damaging to the field. None of these people are thinking about good numerical methods. I think uh, to add on to this point, um, again, some of the qualities that simulation provide, I think, and people assume them and then you build algorithms based on that. And I think one of the things which feature has been repeating again and again, resets. Like, why? Why do we need resets? I mean, in a, in a good learning algorithm, we should not be using resets, right? I mean, the world never resets to its original state. So a good learning algorithm should be able to learn without resets and so on. But now because simulation has resets, everyone wants to use resets. And now we can go back to this old IID kind of data and learning algorithms because of resets and so on. And so I think that's my issue as well. I mean, like, because simulation provides something, we tend to make those assumptions will be true in the real world. We tend to make algorithms based on that. And then they just don't hold on in the real world. Um, and that I think is the sad part. I mean, uh, that like a lot of people will come and tell me, and, and the other thing is democratization has a, is again a double-edged sword. And so this is something which I see with my students all the time. A lot of students come and say, oh, this has been done, see? And I basically look at the paper and it's all simulation. They never tried to real world. And so it's like, is, it the, is the problem solved? Probably not, right? I mean, we all know that. I mean, and I think all of us agree, as Ken said, but I think both these arguments tend to make me feel like we need to make sure that the tests are harder. I mean, tests, it's the whole, all idea of evaluation and testing. And that once we are agreeing on that, I think then we will know whether things work or don't work or something. So uh, I need to interrupt you for a second because we're approaching the end of our fantastic debate. So I would like to give uh, all of the speakers um, the opportunity to deliver their uh, one minute statement or actually 30 second statement uh, to close this debate. So let's uh, maybe go in the same order that we had, as we had for the opening statements, starting with Abena. Um, thanks. So, I mean, I think, as I said, um, I have been trying to debate in competition community and everywhere that there is no real need for simulation. I mean, if you can actually do it in real world, we know the real world constraints. We know what uh, real world constraints will be, and we have to work with that essentially and so on. But I agree that, I mean, a good way of research is having people do multiple, like we cannot invest all in one basket. And I think that is completely clear that we need multiple avenues of research. We should have someone do sim to real, we should have someone do real to real and just real only and so on. I think what we need is a more vigilant uh, evaluation if you're doing sim to real. It's basically what we ask. I mean, like, especially people who are doing real world ask for, right? Please be vigilant. Please make sure you are demonstrating things and make claiming things which are actually true and so on. And I think because that's what in the end counts, I think. In the end, I think, I mean, there will be lots of people doing lots of things, but we need to have some way of knowing which is the right path and evaluate and I think compare. And I think that is critical for ev from every aspect essentially. And so I think in the end, I mean, that's what matters to me a lot. Thank you, Evanes. Peter? Yeah, so I, I would actually, you know, I actually agree in the sense that I, I do think I, I like, the primary thing I, I think is that the sim to real is is not is really about the sim to real gap. So like really on like showing that stuff works, uh, that you get to work in a simulator also works on the real robot is extremely important. And I, I like and I, I think this is we, we just have to kind of make this clear. And I think uh, that like we shouldn't trust anything that works only in a simulator. It's uh, you know you know it's it, it that that's just like. I think we all agree about that one. Um, I do think that there's uh, a lot of 
uh, you know, we have shown, uh, you know, that seem to really works on some problems, but you know, they, it's like the first step, you know, there's so much left and there's so much more research we have to be, uh, be doing there. And I think there's a lot of uh, interesting problems we will be able to solve over the next few years there. Um, but lastly, like, I would like to, like, I, I do feel like that one of the things that excites me the most about the sim to real uh, is this fact that it, it lowers the barriers and there's many more people that can work on it. I actually like that there's a lot of people trying out a lot of different approaches and, and getting interested in robotics by trying out things in, in the simulators. I do think maybe like, actually to Abhinav's point, like, I think we do need to invest a little bit more in setting up better kind of benchmarks and so on, even in the simulator, so we can trust results a little bit better. Like, the, you know, a lot of the Majoka environments in the open AI gym and so on, like they don't give you a lot of faith that things will work on the real world robot. So maybe that's where we should put some of the effort. Um, and, uh, and if we do that, I think, you know, then we would actually be able to trust a lot of the results much better and it would feel us, make us all feel much better. Thank you, Peter. Chris. Okay. Everything's good. If we had infinite resources, we do everything, but we don't. And people like me get asked to write reports to funding agencies saying, where should we put our resources? Should Sim to Real get 10%, 1%, 50% of you know the X million dollars we're gonna spend this year? And my argument is there are other things uh, that are more important than Sim to Real. I mentioned real to real. I mentioned self to self. I, if we just look at the empirical evidence, and I, I apologize for offending the open AI person, but you know, the open AI gym, it's been a lot of work, which hasn't resulted in, as far as I know, anything. Uh, and you know, that's a pretty damning indictment. Uh, so I'm not saying no sim to real, but I think we have to be realistic about what's going to move the field forward. Thank you, Chris. And last but not least, Ken. Thank you. So we'll start by sim to real is where some aspects of a problem are simulated to prepare for experiments with real physical systems. I think we can all agree on that definition of what we're here to talk about. And I want, I think we can also, we've agreed now to dispel with the argument that simulation isn't reality, that there's a reality gap. And we're, that's important to, to, to work on. And we can also dispel the straw man argument that sim alone is not enough. That sim to null is not, is not a good practice. Now, in terms of sim to real, every argument has come to, 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 to seems to be consistent with the point that sim is is a valuable necessary condition. It can be helpful even for building any robot, any physical robot that you're gonna build, Chris, that you do a little bit of simulation there, it's a good thing. And because if it fails in simulation, it's not gonna work in reality, but it's never a sufficient condition. We have to make that crystal clear that if it works in simulation, that doesn't mean that it's gonna work in reality. So I think it, we, uh, it's a pleasure to, to see that we've essentially uh, reached a consensus our opponents have essentially capitulated, and that <laughs> the topic statement here is investing in sim to real is a waste of time and money is completely false and without merit, and it's exactly the opposite. It's an important savings of time and money and a vital component for robotics research. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ebenef. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Peter. It was an amazing, very enjoyable debate. Uh, we're gonna reconvene at the panel discussion and uh, talk a bit more about these points. Um, so that's all for now. Uh, thanks everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.